Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Success Life Live. My name is Eric Reed. It is Friday, so that means it's Fun Friend Friday, and I am so glad you took time out of your schedule, whether here live on the Facebook Live or through the podcast or through the YouTube channel, that you jumped in to spend some time with us. It means a great deal to me. We have our special guest, Joyce Diaz, today on Fun Friend Friday, and has become the new tradition with Fun Friend Friday. Yeah, we had to have a festive frock for Fun Friend Friday or Fun Friend Friday shirt, or I don't know what we're calling it. But I gotta tell you, finding these shirts is getting harder and harder. I think, uh, I think maybe we started a trend and they're no longer uh, considered uh, goodwill material. I don't know, but anyhow, Fun Friend Friday with our Fiesta Frock, frock and Joyce Diaz I announces she's in the room. Good morning, Kayleen. Good morning, Julia. Good morning, Steve. See a couple other people um, jumping in. Take a moment, say good morning. Say good morning to my friend Joyce Diaz. Ah, this is gonna be so fun. You are in for such a special treat. Um, I can say, yes, please do, Greg. I'm sure you have quite a few of them. Um, but anyhow, take a moment, say good morning to our friend Joyce Diaz and settle in for Fun Friend Friday. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you that you will gain, you will grow, you will learn, you will laugh. You will just kick off a Friday like you've never kicked off a Friday now that my friend Joyce D is in the house. Take a moment and share this out. I'm gonna jump over to my Facebook page at, well, uh, maybe I will, maybe I won't, and take a minute and hit the share button. Then I'm gonna take a moment and invite my friend Joyce Diaz to join us. But while I'm doing all that, take a moment and say hello to each other. And I think I've got the share going, so we're good to go on that side. So anyhow, my friend Joyce Diaz, I had the privilege of meeting Joyce um, several years ago, and I gotta tell you, she laughs, she lights my heart up, she makes the day better. Just knowing her, you guys will, will know in just a moment what I mean. I'm going to invite her in. Patty, good morning. Uh, looks like Joe is in the house. Greg is in the house. Steve is in the house. I see a couple other people. I apologize. Buongiorno, my friend. Um, and good morning to all. Good morning, Carol. I am going to get my friend Joyce on the line because I don't want to waste any time. Give me just a moment. Whoop. Let me do this. Let me do this. Let me do this. coming in. I have a little song for her just to, to help welcome her in. Come on, Jean, you know the song. Good morning, Joyce Diaz. Morning, everyone. You introduced me to this song just recently, and I have to tell you. I have I like to raise this so you can see me. Oh, what lovely pearls. I Don't worry, Julia. Uh, uh, Joyce, we have a little <laughs> bit of music going. Much better. Do you like your music? What music? I can barely hear it. Oh. I can't pronounce it. Um, Jean is in the house. She can pronounce it for us. It's the national anthem of India, but the long version oh. with all of the instruments. How do you pronounce it? Jana, Gana, Gina, Mina? <laughs> Jana, Gana, Mana. I Jana, Gana, love Mana. this it's a national long anthem. version that I discovered where all of the... Um, classical instruments of India are used to introduce it. Ah, it's such a beautiful song. Uh, Jean is it like, is. where did you get that song? I'll send you a copy, Jean. Uh, I am so, so, so thrilled you are in the house. Welcome and good morning, my dear. Good morning, Eric. Thank you for having me on your show. It's I, 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 another, it, quite a lot of steam and you're so inspirational in how you do a Facebook Live so consistently. You're a great role model to follow. <laughs> I'm oh, afraid 
you should see me at this time of the morning like you know, at <laughs> night <laughs> i look like something the raccoon wouldn't look at <laughs> so we, if if you seeing a presentable face it's thanks to you eric <laughs> oh see and so now even your husband's like wow i get i get i get glamour joys for breakfast oh well no presentable joy is hardly glamour but uh, there are days i look at myself in the mirror and i wonder that my husband stays married to me <laughs> <laughs> i can tell you that it must be a great joy having your sense of humor mixed with wisdom um in his life every day so i you know i i get it you know this doesn't happen all naturally i have a team of about 30 <laughs> that makes me look this bad so uh, i get it thank you you you're very kind but i think he attributes all his gray hair to me <laughs> <laughs> I, i i gave up coloring it was too expensive so i'm going to jump in and i'm probably going to put you on the spot but that's what great people like you do you are such a phenomenal speaker and when i say speaker you can hold a stage so well has that always been your giftedness I don't know if it has always been my giftedness and I'm going to be extremely honest here my own family members think I talk too much <laughs> <laughs> No that feeling They they've spent their entire life trying to get me to shut up <laughs> Uh they're always trying to distract me so I won't say things but I decided because I love to speak I do I mean just generally talking to people I love to do that I figured I may as well put my money where my mouth is <laughs> I, 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 amen. You know, get paid for what you love to do. Isn't that what living a life of success is about? And and, and when you say, does it come naturally? Um, uh, again, I think you're being very kind. Uh, I have had a few wonderful speaker mentors, uh, and I think the best mentors that I've had have typically worked with my style of delivery. So they've not tried to make me. turn me into a different speaker or tell me uh i i am very much a resist the rules type of person if someone <laughs> gives me a formula i will not follow it that's how i am so i really like um uh, a couple of mentors that i've had in particular that i can mention one is rodi galbraith from the john maxwell team the other is um uh, dustin matthews uh from the speaking speaker empire uh and a third one was les brown Okay. Uh, and all of them have taught me that uh, the only way I can reach an audience is to be myself. Basically, to do anything in life is be yourself. Don't be fake. Don't try and be somebody else. If you are a bore, be a thorough, deadly bore. Like do it to the best of your ability if that's your gift, you know, to bore people because you know there are there are there are advantages to being a bore. You can uh shut the room up. <laughs> you can put them all to sleep. You, you well, I think one thing in a room full of insomniacs. I think one of the things that you point out and I see it often and often because of my coaching and what I do people will ask me to evaluate or help them with a the speech and the first or second time they're trying to be somebody else. They try and either fit that cadence of a speaker who wants to inspire and they get into a a rhythm or they get into a style of speech or a language of speech and you can feel when it's disconnected from them as if they're in theater mm -hmm. which is a completely different thing than being an inspirational speaker how did you bring the theater of joys into the inspirational speaking part so uh let me see if i understand your question correctly you are asking how i bring my individual style of speaking uh in order to help inspire people yeah great yes i think that summarizes it better so often we have a message we want to deliver and that can be very blog style written but when yes. you have to get on the stage and hold the attention and set the emotion into the room there's a bit of theater involved a uh, performance yes so uh it's it's interesting that uh, i say the word performance i'm reading this really interesting book by ritu basin which is called the authenticity principle 
and she talks about there is being real and then there is being a performer performing uh, to other people's expectations and um, being less than who you are you don a mask on and you um, perform basically you're performing in a job you're performing in a relationship you you you're doing all kinds of things so i uh, personally don't think i am a performer so much as being authentic and but in that authenticity there is a certain craft uh which you know i've learned from all of my speaker mentors uh because i'm given to being so wordy there is a certain craft in being very concise and precise and delivering your message in the fewest possible words that will not only reach the audience that they will be able to understand in simple english and that your message gets across because sometimes i notice with a lot of speakers especially the ones that ramble on and on like i used to do because that's what, <laughs> what i got to do <laughs> i can't say i'm over it it's it's i'm a, a work in progress like i have to keep working at it but you lose the message i mean the story might be riveting but you lose the message and uh, i know when i was first speaking i did have this tendency to ramble on uh which you know my family wants to gag me and shut me up and stick me in a corner uh, with my head in a bucket but um basically uh i struggled with this 3 minute format of trying to get a, a whole vignette down like you know which will take me 10 minutes to deliver down into a 3 minute format but in doing that i had to strip out all of the unnecessary and so if you call that a performance uh i wouldn't call it the word performance i would call it the craft of speaking effectively and transferring the message without losing who you are because if i was you eric i would deliver a fantastic speech but it would not reach in the same way because they would they could they would be able to tell i'm imitating you or i'm imitating uh channeling les brown or now i'm being uh john maxwell and saying you know oh they walk among us these zombies they walk among us <laughs> and and i, I can't see it that way and i see that so often and out of courtesy my heart aches because you can hear the message you can hear the passion you can see that little kernel that they really wanted to deliver but because of doubt and maybe lack of rehearsal and mentors and coaching they surrounded it with less brownness or john maxwell or tony robbins or all of these Ray Browns like they've copied they've watched all of their 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 mentors their inspirers their leaders and they said oh I'm going to speak just like so and so and when they do that it's like well I've lost you and I came to hear Joyce I came to hear Joe I came to hear Mike I came to hear the individual and they get lost in that now I'm going to just I'm going to If I may just I, mention something Eric sorry yeah. to interrupt you but there no, is no. something uh, you know a lot of people look for role models and then they model themselves on that role that they admire and uh, i don't uh, i don't look for role models there are lots of people i admire but um, if anyone anyone at all in the world you know whether it's a family member or whether it's a mentor or whether it's anyone at all if they're trying to make me less than who i am i know i'm going to resist it I will resist it. I'll fight to be me like it has been the battle of my life and it's not something I'm going to give up easily because I think <laughs> I'm winning. <laughs> I um, think you're wonderful. So please don't thank lose you. you. Thank you. So there's a difference between a role model that you admire and you would like to be doing things and there's a difference between imitating somebody. So you can emulate the actions but you don't have to lose who you are when you emulate those actions because you admire like i admire gandhi but you won't catch me walking around in a dhoti and a staff that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> i know i wouldn't look as good as he did um so i have a couple things and i'm like i rabbit rabbit i would love i would love and i know if you say no it's okay i would love for you if you could pull it back out of your deep dark place the connection speech Oh, you really like being smacked, don't you, Eric? I love being spontaneous. Do you think it's in there enough that you can at least Oh, I can the... tell it. I'm not going to speak it like a speaker. It's different. I can tell the incident if you if you like. Yes. And so here's but let me set you up so you can have a minute to, you know, step into your 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 role. So often when you're preparing a speech or you're getting ready, 
there is this story, and you may have told the story two or three times to friends, neighbors, in a training, in a seminar, and you start to hear that story as like, man, people are, people are hearing this, people are connecting it. And as you develop speech, as you start to say, you know what, this one resonates consistently with a broad audience. Now, how do I take that story, which you're gonna to share to us, and use it to impact a larger room? And when I heard you give the speech or tell the story, <laughs> I fell in love with you. I was oh. like, she is my Anne of Green Gables. She is my kindred spirit. Oh, she, is, <laughs> she delivered, you delivered this. And I know it's, I think you have it on your YouTube. I know I've seen it somewhere recorded. Oh, it's I, probably on YouTube. I think uh, Roddy might have put it up. Because I think that, I delivered we'll that one. Ask him. Yeah. So, so one of the things, um, one of the things that Roddy really taught me well, uh, is pull out the stories from your own experience. And like you know, that has been something that has happened to me genuinely. A number of really weird things. I attract the weird, like like <laughs> a beacon. Like I have, the, I have a whole slew of weird experiences that I never thought of because I had never, wasn't a speaker in, in my life. I wasn't thinking of my life as, oh, here's a lot of material for speaking. But uh, he took us through an exercise where we drew on all kinds of funny experiences. Actually, in my case, they're all funny. Uh, from life that we took for granted. And then you can kind of, you know, spin the same story around to make a different point. Like my movie star story, if you're familiar with that. I mean, some, a, a lot of, uh, hi everyone, I'm just so focused on the conversation. I cannot greet everyone while I'm speaking, but I'm so glad you're here. But some of you who've been on the John Maxwell team, for instance, may have heard about the movie star story. You can spin that so many different ways. The same story can make a different point. For instance, you can make the point about be yourself because you're not going to achieve stardom pretending to be um, Julia Roberts or pretending to be um, Sheryl Sandberg. You have to be yourself. Whatever success you're going to achieve, you're going to ex uh, as a, um, uh, accomplish whatever you do as yourself. Unless you're a zombie, of course, then you can just, you know, pop, uh, inhabit the body of Brad Pitt and then you can be Brad Pitt for a day. But I don't know Brad that. Pitt, so I don't think I really want to be him. But uh, the point that I'm making is um, one story can make several different points. Ooh. So the that connection story that you're talking about, which because there might be people in, in here that do not know that story, maybe I should tell the story first, and then I can tell you how it can make different points, the same story. Perfect. So I want to, so I'm, you're getting there. Sorry to interrupt, but hey, it's my show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> did you hear the difference? She looked at her life for lessons that she learned through experience, and then said, what is the lesson that I learned now? How can I make this story a lesson that others can learn from? And so often I'll see somebody try and create a, spe a speech from this is the lesson I wanna teach, now let me create the story. And there's that feeling of disconnect, like you started at the end and then found the middle and started at the beginning, whereas what you said is, I learned in this moment. Now let me use this moment to teach a lesson. So please do the connection thing. I'm just going to settle back. Yeah, I, well, I'm story. not going to do it like a speech speech. You'll right? do it beautifully. Standing on Quit the stage with a mic. Up. Yeah. So I'll just tell the story. Um, and thank you, everyone, for listening. And thank you, Eric, for all the very kind words about it. Because it's not my, uh, once you hear the story, you'll know it was not my um, shining moment in life, <laughs> <laughs> let's say. Um, so there was this um, way back when I was working in the hospitality industry uh, and I was around 20 or 21, I can't recall. Uh, it was my very first important assignment and I was assigned to go and meet this group of aristocrats uh, at a five-star hotel. And uh, when I walk into this hotel, somewhat shy, I was somewhat shy and you know, everyone uh, seemed a little intimidating to me, especially if they had titles back then. I really don't care about titles anymore, but back then I did. And uh, I walk into the lobby of this five-star hotel and there's complete pandemonium going on. There's this, at the center, the epicenter of this uh, uh, noise that's happening um, is this tall six-foot lady throwing a tantrum. She's Italian, so, you know, they, they throw the best tantrums uh, <laughs> in the world. And believe me, I'm an expert on tantrums. So um, to my horror, I discover that this lady belongs to this group that I'm supposed to meet. <laughs> and... Uh, 
you know, uh, how do I now extricate myself from this mess? So I kind of walk straight into the center of this crowd that's around her and I grab her by the arm and I start trotting her over to the elevator. I'm just trying to put her into a box, really, in the elevator with the nearest box I could find. And some of her friends accompany me and she continues throwing, you know, in, in uh, Italian. And my Italian was very poor back then, but it was enough to understand that she was hurling a lot of insults at us. You know, she was saying, ladri, ladri, sono tutto ladri, hanno rubato il mio passaporto. She went on and on and on. And uh, basically what it was is somebody had stolen her passport while she was on tour. And she was afraid that she couldn't travel with her friends back to Italy that night. And it was a weekend. So, you know, passport office was closed. Everything was closed. And she went on hurling these insults, you know, calling my countrymen thieves and so on. And I'm just dying to slap her and wondering how I'm going to control myself because I was a kid back then. I had no, no restraints whatsoever. Um, not that I do now, but I pretend I do most of the time. But uh, so I just shut my eyes and I'm counting to 10. I'm going one, two, three, and she keeps on hurling these insults. And suddenly I hear this loud thwack and um, my eyes open because I'm startled. And I see 10 faces peering at me. And, and this is the point I made on the John Maxwell team because he has this book called Everyone Communicates, Few Connect. And uh, so in the speech, I just said, it looks like while everyone had been communicating, I had connected. <laughs> uh, and of course, it stops all her ranting. And when I go to the hotel, the others, her friends tell me she hasn't eaten all day because she's so upset. Uh, and I tell her, sit down there and pick up that banana, eat that banana. And she picks it up like a little monkey and she eats and her eyes never leave my face. Like wherever I'm going, she's kind of following me with her eyes. Uh, and then I called because I had no connection. I was very young and early in my very early in my career. So I had no influence uh, back then. And uh, I contacted the president at 3 a.m. in the morning. And I said, well, you're the president of the company. I'm dealing with this mad woman out here and she has to travel and she has no passport and she has a uh, passport office is closed and it's a weekend, blah, 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 blah. Can you do something? So he says, I'm very grateful to you for trying to handle the situation. Just head over to the airport and I'll see what I can do. Take her along. So I did. And of course he man because he had, you know, he was the president of the company. He had connections. He managed to pull some strings and bribe some officials or how, whatever he had to do to get her to travel. So she sends a letter after she arrives in Italy, uh, thanking the president uh, for getting her on that plane and just absolutely raving about me. <laughs> and at that point in time, the uh, raving in, in, in good terms, I mean, not raving mad at me having slapped her and so on. And the president said, I need to get to know who this girl is that kind of took charge of everything and handled these VIPs. Uh, in, in, she did not tell him that I had slapped her, though. She did not. I told him that. I confessed. I said, oh, my goodness, like, uh, you know, what did I just do? Like, I've just blown my career to bits. But because of that one particular incident, I got my very first promotion in my career. So that, you know, totally encouraged me. I should go around the world slapping everybody. But <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, what the lesson that it taught me, though, is that when you're doing the right thing, uh, when your intention is right, nothing that you do is wrong. Uh, you could you could um, do um, you could say the wrong thing you could do the wrong thing but when the intention is right and the outcome is right nothing is wrong really and a lot of people shiver and they're you know trying to be politically correct and they're trying to do everything that other people tell them to do and they're following the stereotype and the role models uh, and forgetting to be themselves but it's when you are yourself with all your flaws and all your mistakes and all the things that you do wrong you still stand out. You're no longer the zombie that the world wants you to be. We See, have too many I, zombies. So, so I love that story. And we are going to have to, I know Kayleen knows somebody that knows somebody that can get to Roddy faster than I can. So he'll have to find the video and post it for us because it's a beautiful speech. But so if you're somebody that's going into public speaking or if you want to influence people through speech, Understand what she did. She set the stage of her flawness, her uncertainty, her desires and her passion to make an impact, to change the world. And she did it with enough humor that we, we, we moved her off the stage and down beside us in a way that it was like, we can, I could just still be like, oh, there are so many people in my life I need to connect with. And when you tell a story like that, the audience is able to no longer see you as this 
speaker, like this way off in the distance thing that they're supposed to take some golden lesson back from the mountaintop from. They see you as somebody that's shoulder to shoulder with them. And then what you do so beautifully in your humor with your wisdom is be able to say, and guess what I learned? As a way of saying, and by the way, if you didn't see this, here's an opportunity for you to learn without having to connect to other people. <laughs> and, and because you were in the room of John Maxwell people when you told it, you used the word, everybody communicates, you people connect. You used the word about influence. You learned, used the word about intentionality. So you planted words in the story in the speech that the audience was already beginning to familiarize themselves or connect with. And so when I listen to you as a speaker, I see that it is not just up there rambling, telling a story, but you really funnel through all of the extra stuff and get right into the meat of the meal, so to speak. Yeah, stop it, Joseph. You're making me laugh and I'm trying to keep my composure. Um, yes, uh, the thing is, uh, we have had all had experiences, weird or wonderful, or even, you know, what we take for granted and we think is ordinary in our lives because it has happened and it's just an incident is really pretty extraordinary to the audience. Uh, extraordinary. Oh, did you, can, wait a minute. I got to interrupt you. I want people to hear that. Our ordinary is often extraordinary or unique to those outside of us. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, but we take it for granted, right? Because it's our life, we've lived it. We don't see anything out of the, uh, out of the ordinary when we are living it in the process of living. But as a speaker, you bring the same um, incident out of your treasure chest of memories or whatever, and uh, you make a point, they get it. Now, hasn't, any one of you, hasn't every one of you wanted to slap somebody? Yeah, raise your hand if you wanted to slap someone. And have you? More than, are we allowed to say more than once a day? <laughs> exactly, but you must have learned something from it, right? Either not to slap them or because you don't always get the good- Most of the time it. I just learned that my reach is too short. <laughs> Yeah, well, it depends on how you how you want to slap and who you want to slap, how hard you want to slap, how many times you want to slap them, mm -hmm. or whether you want to whack them right off this planet. But the thing is that one incident, <laughs> please stop that. <laughs> I'm going to start a marital fight on this because I can see Lisa, uh, Lisa and Joseph going at it. But um, that instantly connects you to the audience because everyone has at some point or the other wanted to slap somebody. So they're suddenly inside my story. They're in my skin. They're wanting to slap the lady along with me. Like, you know, why can't you just slap her, kind of shut her up somehow? So when you draw the audience in with you into the experience, then the story is no longer yours. It's theirs. Because they see your story. For you, it's an incident in your story that you're telling. But the audience is seeing it through their own filter of experience. They're thinking of somebody they have wanted to slap. They are thinking of some mistake they made. I, so I love, recap, when they come inside the story, when they leave, they take the message and the lesson with them from a personal perspective, from a personal, it, it gets in their clothes, it gets in their DNA. When you try and deliver the message to them, push down on them with the message, there's that natural resistance that we all have of pushing back against the bubble. But when you invite them inside the bubble, so to speak, and mm -hmm. share the experience, then you're sharing the lesson. Then when they walk back out, they believe that they've actually experienced the lesson firsthand with you. Precisely. And so often when we try and create a speech or create a lesson or create a moment of inspiration, what I encourage people to do when I work with them is sometimes, okay, what is it you want me to learn? Now, we all sometimes have to go into a particular venue where they say, can you teach about passion or about connection or about communication? And so we start with sort of this thesis mentality and try and go from the top of the page to the bottom of the page, talking about communication, compassion, ethics, character, whatever it is, instead, 
I like to think in a very mind mapping way of like, okay, this is the thing I want them to learn. Now, all of the experiences I've had in my life that have taught me this, let me just sort of jot them out and around the big bubble. Now, which ones are most common now? Okay, so now my experience over here taught me this lesson. So how do I bring people into this experience so that they can learn the lesson? And, uh, exactly. and I think you do that beautifully. Thank you. Uh, I, I just want to mention um, uh, also, you know, your intention might be one thing, like as a speaker and you're crafting the talk. And uh, if you've listened to a lot of speakers, they tend to be very preachy. You know, I'm so holy. I'm holier than thou. I'm going to tell you that you need to have compassion. But then when you actually know the person, you find the person has no compassion whatsoever you know, uh, but they will be talking about it and they'll be preaching it and, and you can see the disconnect and you don't buy into that story. Uh, you have to be who you are. You should not be talking about things that you don't practice yourself because you come across as very inauthentic and the audience is very, very smart. They can tell when you're not what you're talking about. You know? And I think that's where we move from being a trainer or a teacher to an inspirational speaker. The training teacher can deliver content, information, ideas, processes, systems, and there is a place and a need for that in personal growth, personal development, life change. We all need to learn some basic techniques and strategies. And then there is the inspirational speaker that begins to water the seed, that begins to fertilize and let that change and that transformation grow through a story, through a speech, that when you walk out, you feel ignited. And so when, for those of the, that are watching or thinking of like, how do I build my influence? How do I begin to make the impact I want? You've got to make the shift from being a teacher trainer to being an inspirer and influencer. And if there's anybody that you could listen to that I would just say, you know what? Every one of them is gold. Now, I know you're going to disagree with me. I love the way you teach. I love the way you tell a story. I love your humor. I, I don't know. There's just, I would, like I said, you're my kindred spirit because I have been around those Italians that everything is I giant. Not talking about you, Greg, because, you know, you're just a transplant. <laughs> and how you just, like, want to put a lid on the situation. And, I have been in those moments where people, your, your Hollywood, your superstar moment where, you know, they think they're everything and then the world doesn't notice them. I love your stories. Thank you. And, I, and I'm going to tell you, like, you know, I'm certainly a work in progress. I'm not up there and nor am I comparing myself, nor do I want to be who those famous people are, like a Les Brown. Les Brown is Les Brown. He's living his life and his experience. This is Joyce. Get to know me. Right? <laughs> Uh, wherever it is I am, this is who I am, for better or for worse. But uh, one of the things I have learned uh, in my speaking, though, Eric, is, um, you know, if you pretend to be more perfect than you are, this is not, when you're talking, it's not about you as a speaker. It really is about the audience. Because if you're talking in order to impress the audience with how wonderful Joyce is, or what a great speaker she is, then you've completely lost the point of that channel of influence that you could oh, have. What the and, audience and, should, I yeah, think what the I, audience should feel is how great we are. We are just like her. She's ordinary, just like us. She has experiences just like us. She has flaws just like us. She has wanted to slap somebody and she did. I wish I had done that. <laughs> well, you know what I, I mean? Think, the connection is what's important. I, exactly. I think the thrill when you're a good speaker is not that that spotlight is on you, but that the light in the room is risen because of what you're presenting. That you can feel people sitting three feet away, growing and changing and transforming and laughing and connect. The energy goes back and forth, it's not one way. But I think you made a really big point, and I see it often as well. If you're gonna do this, you have got to accept this is not you. This is not about you. 
you're going to be bruised, you're going to be beaten, you're going to be humiliated, you're going to have to stand in some mucky, ugly water in order to get your point across. And if you try and show up all perfectly manicured, suit and tie, hair done right, and present an inspirational speech, yeah, you'll have some level of success, but soon people will disconnect because they never get to know the person behind the speech. So you're going to have to come out and be ego-free. You're going to have to be willing to admit your flaws and, and your growth and their hero's journey, so to speak, if you want to really make an impact and you really want to take it to the next place. Yes, uh, the, I think the metaphor I would use is like, you're like the torch in the room, but you're lighting up the room. But yes, yes. everyone sees where the torch, so you can't avoid being not seen, you know, unless you're on the radio. And I do have a radio face, but uh, <laughs> just, I'm just saying. But um, uh, I also wanted to tell you, um, I don't know whether you're familiar with my Greek story, Eric. I, it's all Greek ahead. to me. I'm not, I can I sit I'm and listen to your stories all day. Good morning. I, thank you. <laughs> but no, I'm not going to bore the audio, uh, your, your viewers with uh, that story. But I just wanted to make a point about, the, uh, just wanted to emphasize the point that it's really how the audience individually, each member of the audience is receiving your story. They're receiving it through the filter of their experience. So my experience, uh, when I tell the story about Greece, going to Greece or wanting to go to Greece since I was a little girl, um, is my story, right? And I'm talking about the perseverance and the persistence and, and the not being um, um, dismayed by things not going the way I want. Like, you know, I want to learn Greek, but there was no Greek uh, courses that I could find when I was back growing up in India. And so I took German <laughs> because German began with a P. So, you know, I mean, I was a child. So uh, I thought, you know, G was closer to Greece than learning French, but, but I got a scholarship to France. So I went to France because France was closer to Greece. It was still not Greece, but I was in the direction of my dream. I kept moving one step at a time in my own childish ways. Uh, the point that I'm making, I'm going to get very quickly to the point here, is it's a funny story about how that all came about. And I did eventually get to Greece. But the story is of persistence through the setbacks before I finally got there. And there was a particular audience member the first time I told the story in London. And she came up to me uh, after the talk with tears in her eyes. And I thought, you know, okay, maybe tears of laughter because generally I, I, I tell myself <laughs> I'm very dry and I get um, a reaction of laughter. And she had tears in my eyes and she said, I was planning on committing suicide tonight. And your story has changed that because I saw I was going to commit because she her friends had dragged her over to the uh, talk uh, because they said, we just need to get you out because you're in the house and you're moping and you're depressed because she'd been dumped by a boyfriend and she was ready to give up on her life. And she saw me taking everything in my stride, lightening it up and whether or not they could see the, the feelings of dismay when things were not going the way I wanted on my way to Greece. Um, I was astounded by that. In my mind, I'm going, what did I just say? Like, why am I getting this reaction? Like, I'm not that kind of a speaker that saves lives. You know what I mean? Like, I was, you could have just, knock me down with a feather. But uh, this is what I mean is the audience is reacting to whatever you're telling them through a different filter. Each one has come from a different life mm. experience. And how the message is translating and communicating to them is very, very unique and individual. So it really isn't about you as a speaker. It really is about them and how they will receive that message. So that was certainly not my intention when I crafted that speech. I have I worked really hard to get the laughs in, the payoffs, you know, how Roddy talks about the payoffs, um, get the audience response. But that was something that I was completely uh, like out of left field. But it brought home the point that sometimes you think you're speaking about one thing and you think you're making a point about one thing, but what the audience is receiving is completely different. So long as they get the message that what you're trying to convey that you have to persist past the disappointments. Uh, that was my message. Intrinsically so, delivered so, in a fun but way. I, I think that you guys just hit replay, just hit replay. Come back to this. I don't know. It's like 40 minutes in and hear that lesson again. You went with the intent 
of teaching a lesson that persistence past disappointment has a reward. Yes. You pulled from a personal story or experience or a life lesson, you crafted it in a way that Joyce experiences life with a bit of a smile and a bit of a sarcastic humor about herself, you know, yes. self-effacing Joyce. And you delivered it from Joyce through Joyce with the intention of teaching the same message, persistence past the point of disappointment. Because you were so authentically you in your delivery, I could, I could buy in as the audience from where I was at in the moment versus feeling as if I had to climb all the way up on stage next to you on the pedestal in the spotlight, pull out my workbook and you know, that kind of lesson. Instead, I was able to see that you are still standing, still laughing, still smiling at the end of the persistence story. So I too, no matter where I'm at in my journey can still stand at the end of persistence and disappointment. So I can yeah. see exactly how that connects because we all have persistence, disappointment, 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 back on the horse, persistence. How we experience it is completely unique. And so you show it, shared it from a unique perspective. So again, when you're crafting a speech, when you're trying to connect, when you're trying to move into that inspirational speaker kind of space, don't start at the top of the page and write a thesis on persistence past disappointment. Stand in the middle of the page and say, where did I learn this lesson? And you may have two or three examples. And then reflect on those experiences over and over again and pull out the meat, pull out the lesson, pull out the insight. See yourself sort of with that drone camera, how you were perceived by others, how you were perceiving yourself in that moment how you perceived yourself in the future sense and the past sense, and then teach from that and they'll all walk away with the message. Brilliant. You are so brilliant. Oh, thank you. You're so good well, for my bullet head. My hat <laughs> doesn't love you. <laughs> well, we have Joe taking great notes and I noticed a couple other people have popped in. Take a moment, share this out, you guys. I tell you, I tell you, there is so much nugget. I can't wait to get the trans transcript, transcribe, transcription, or as they say in French, transcriba or whatever, I don't know. Transcription. Um, pardon? Transcription, I'm just pronouncing it the French way. I don't know what the word is. So you do, you mentioned once in a speech, five languages? Seven. Seven, but India counts as two. Um, so. <laughs> what? so what seven languages do you speak? Uh, well, I speak, um, well, I grew up in India, you know, where they have 32 languages. So you already drop that, um, you drop the filter of, you can only communicate in one. Because, you know, when you go in the workplace in India, for instance, when you're sitting at lunch, there are many languages spoken and you understand all of them. So oh, those God. are all like, do I speak them all? I don't know. But uh, I do speak uh, three Indian languages fluently which is Hindi, Marathi, which is the state where Bombay is. I, I come from Bombay. Um, and I speak a Goan language, Konkani. So the three languages that I speak fluently, I understand other Indian languages because the root of the languages are similar. And to some I don't understand at all because they're completely different. Like they're really ancient uh, origin. So if you're not exposed to Sanskrit, for instance, you don't understand. Of, I grew up, uh, I learned, I studied in an English medium. I count in English. And they said, that's your mother tongue. The language in which you count okay. numbers in your head is your mother tongue, right? So although I, I was brought up, I grew up in India and I'm Indian uh, by origin, I count in English. So I kind of feel a bit of a fake when people tell me, oh, you speak such excellent English because that is the language in which I think, you know? So English is my uh, native tongue, if, if you will. Um, I, and then I started speaking because of wanting to go to Greece. I started learning French and then German and then uh, Italian. Uh, these three languages I speak fairly fluently. I would say uh, French is my strongest. Uh, German and Italian, I can, with German, I can hold my own in a debate and make a point. Like if someone wants to argue with me, I can Which hold with the argue. German is quite an But in Italian, I'm not that good. In Italian, um, uh, I'm fairly fluent. Like I can get by in a remote village and get what I want type of thing. Uh, and then I learned Spanish and I learned Russian, uh, but 
I can sing propaganda songs fluently. Like uh, you just poke me in my sleep and say, start singing. I can start singing a propaganda song because we, I learned Russian at the time when Russia still existed with the communism and all of that. So the teachers were teaching us propaganda songs, and I know them by. <laughs> so, um, but with Spanish, um, uh, because I went on the with the John Maxwell on the mission to um, for leadership to Guatemala, uh, I could understand it. But I tend to respond in Italian for some strange reason. I don't know what that because it is uh, two languages are so similar. Yeah. Yeah, you know. But uh, I haven't activated my Spanish, so I need to really immerse myself in that. And uh, for a person who loves to talk, learning multiple languages is a very good idea because now you have <laughs> a wider open field. And I'm so, certainly so not perfect, never but I have enough airport. to connect, and that's enough for me. It's it's that's good enough for me. I, I think that's amazing. So for those, it's time for our fun friend Friday. And I love this part Ooh. of the show. This is your sort of minute with Maxwell. You can do it in French, German, Italian, Russian, Spanish, Gujarati, Hindu, and I forgot the other one. Um, you pick your language of choice. But for those of you who haven't seen Fun Friend Friday or are listening through the podcast or YouTube, what we do is we've got envelopes. And inside each of these envelopes is a leadership type word like desire like balance, like contributions, sacrifice, legacy, influence. I don't know if we have connection in one of the envelopes. We'll just have to wait and see. You get to pick an envelope. These envelopes are blue diamond, yellow Banana. moon, whoop, rainbow, red balloon, green clover. Oof, these are all mixed up. Yellow or orange star and pink hearts. So why you think about it, we have to do our famous Fun Friend Friday song. Travel down a road and back again. Your heart is true. Your I don't know, did they have the Golden Girls where you, when you grew up or have you seen it? Wait, sorry, say that again, Eric. The Golden Girls? Nope, I, I don't know. I've heard of them. I don't okay, watch this a lot is of the television. Theme song I record television. It. All right, so which envelope okay. have you chosen? So I don't remember, but the one that looked like a banana? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go bananas. <laughs> Thank you for complimenting me on my artwork. Um, That's a banana, yes. That would be oh. yellow moon. So oh. in the US, we have sugary cereals, go figure. And there's a cereal called Lucky Charms and the marshmallow, the marshmallow treats are these yeah. shapes. And so there's oh, a yellow okay. moon shape. And your word, ooh, this, I honestly, I did not plant this. So your word in the tradition of Steve Harvey and letting you see it is persistence. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I I'm, think that's just divine. You're playing my theme song there. <laughs> persistence. Um, first of all, what is persistence? I think everybody knows it's persisting despite the odds, despite the disappointments, despite the rejections, despite the setbacks, despite, um, uh, you know, your naysayers and people who tell you to give up on your dreams. And uh, you have to be extremely stubborn and determined. But I think the word persistent, what is inherent within the P is the C, which is commitment. If you're committed to your goal or to your dream, that if you're really, really powerfully committed, uh, that is what helps you to persist. Because without that commitment, giving up is very easy. You can just give up on any old dream. Uh, like in, 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 uh, when going to Greece, for instance, I did not have the money. Uh, I did not have uh, any map, roadmap. I did not have the language. I just had this dream that was fueled by a book I read when I was six years old, you know, on Greek mythology. Uh, and I thought it was a land of, you know, uh, unicorns and minotaurs and uh, all these wonderful, strange creatures that I, when my sister said, that's a place that actually exists. And she showed it to me on a map. It's not a fairy tale, like, you know, up in the air type of thing. Uh, I was so um, consumed by that dream that a lot of my decisions as a child and at college and everywhere was fueled by wanting to get to Greece somehow. 
and there was nobody people that laughed at me for taking german instead of greek or who laughed at me uh for accepting the scholarship to go to france um and, and you know they were afraid for me because you know in india they did not want you to go abroad because they see the uh, the west as the wild wicked west type of thing and i said i'm up to it because i have got all the greek gods behind me type of thing but um uh, <laughs> the persistence is what brought me through but you know as i mentioned in the talk that i gave on persistence as well is uh, buba says that every journey has a destination that the traveler is unaware of so you think you're persisting towards one thing but it's what happens along the journey that ultimately changes your life not the dream that you've achieved the goal is just like a a north star towards which you're headed but it's who you become what you learn who you meet the connections you make how you develop and evolve along that journey is what brings you all everything that you ever dreamed of so it really pays to be persistent and to persevere there's oh god i'm going to have to be taking notes all day i love the idea that you match persistence with commitment and not passion because so often passion passion can wait passion is a feeling and is feeling being it's all chemical sometimes whereas commitment is that thing you write down and i sometimes say that there's a covenant and there's a commitment and when we make a covenant with our dreams with our goals with our vision we can't break it based on feelings and so i love that persistence and commitment are tied together i love that you looked at my notebook for next week's for uh teaching and one of the topics that i'm writing out is is your goal obstructing your vision which you sort of touched on that the desire to get to a place sometimes we forget about the journey along the way and what we're supposed to be learning and precisely, that precisely precisely eric it's um uh i think the goals and the dreams we are given are not uh as the end point of what we need to accomplish it's what's put into our minds and our hearts for our own evolution as people we grow when we follow our dreams we don't we stunt ourselves deliberately when we ignore or deny our dreams and i love that you point out that the path though we would like as entrepreneurs solopreneurs mompreneurs dadpreneurs creatorpreneurs We would like to think that it's this beautiful straight line that I have hereby declared my goal is to go to Greece and these are the four steps that I'll complete between now and the end of the year to achieve it. I love that you were like I have this desire to go to Greece and I don't have it mapped out but somehow going to France is closer to Greece so I'll take that road and see what the perspective looks like from that position to go to the next position to get to the next position. to get on a bus in the middle of the night with a bunch of girlfriends and end up in Greece kind of thing that you are willing to experience the journey towards it because you know you're going to get you know because of that feeling internally that you're going to get there you just haven't figured out the how no you don't have to figure out the how actually you just have to start moving towards it at least this has been my experience you just have to take those little teeny tiny baby steps all of us are capable of taking tiny steps we're not capable of taking the big strides but the tiny steps as you move towards your dream the path begins to unfold so you don't have to and, know the how yeah and sometimes i think if we get so committed to the how yeah you know we could be sitting in a bus station next to oprah winfrey but because we're so focused on this we miss the opportunity to tell her our dreams and she'd be like well psh- You want to borrow my plane? Let's go. Because we think it's only going to materialize in this way, only going to be this way, only going to be through these channels, only going to be through these five steps. And and then it we narrow our options uh without realizing it because sometimes it things happen uh one of my mentors uh, early mentors uh taught me this word called auto magic. Things happen automatically when you take those baby steps. it's like the you know this is what i i truly believe this is the universe will conspire to make it happen like they want your dreams god wants your dreams to happen because you're taking those steps you're showing the commitment you're showing your intention and then there's nothing that can get in the way it doesn't matter who your naysayers are or who are the people who will put the impediments if you have you consistently with commitment keep taking those little steps there's no way on earth that your dream will not come true but the dream is not what the end goal is 
It really isn't. The dream, whether it's a little tiny, you know, it seems like a silly dream wanting to go to Greece, right? Or, or a little girl wanting to have a pony or whatever. But the in the attainment of that tiny goal, it's it, there's a saying in in uh, India, in Hindi, which uh, I'm just going to translate it to English, is... Do it in Hindi because Jane's here. You have to do it in Hindi At every first. horizon, there is a new horizon. The, the horizon is not the end of your journey. At every horizon, you will see new horizons. And so your dreams will alter as you reach each goal. But those are the milestones, those are the goal posts or the stars that pull you towards them and which shows you the path as you go forward. Oh, so I it's so, so agree. Um, I love auto magically. I'm going to borrow that somewhere in my in my future. It's I'm yours. Just telling you. And don't I won't borrow, give you don't credit have to because it. that's the kind of guy I am. <laughs> um, it's where uh, PK, uh, PK Martin, who wrote um, Home Run Life, talks about when the super intersects the natural, it becomes supernatural. What you, because your passion and your desire and your pers persistence and your commitment were doing what comes natural to you, to others it looked supernatural because the super, the divine, the great, the God was infusing it. And so you look supernatural in it, but to you in process, it just felt natural. Yes, like you know how I ultimately got to Greece, though, um, Eric. Did you know somebody? It's an example of the auto magic, if you want to know. Um, so um, I can post the link to the video as well later on in your uh, stream please, please, of please, comments. Please, please, please do. But uh, for people who want the whole story, but. I wanted to get to Greece so badly, so I accepted that scholarship to France. I wanted to get to Greece when they were having school tours from the university, the school that I was attending in France. But the tickets got so, were all sold out when I went there. So I went to Italy instead because that's the only one which had room. <laughs> and I figured Italy See, was I closer to Greece. Somebody had exactly. To take their seats. Um, <laughs> and then, so I was uh, Italy, but feeling really distressed because, you know, it's not like uh, it was an easy trip to get to uh, France even at the time. I did not, I was, wasn't loaded with money that I could just, you know, hop on a plane and go. Uh, not that I'm very rich now, but now I can make the choice and I can go whenever I want, right, to Europe. But back then I couldn't. Um, but I was on that bus, on that actual bus tour in Italy for uh, students. And the bus driver, so here I am at the Vatican. And this, for some strange reason, I always arrive at the Vatican at midnight. Don't ask me. <laughs> it's some sort of like a karmic thing or whatever. Every time I've been to Rome and I've been there several times, I've always arrived at the Vatican at midnight the clock strikes, like I said, oh my God, like I feel like I'm in an, uh, one of those groundhog day type of thing. Like it's an action repeat, why am I here every night? Anyway, so I'm telling God, like, you know, what am I doing in Italy? I need to be in Greece. And I get into the bus with all tears running down my face, feeling that wrench of disappointment. It was really gut-wrenching. And then the bus driver says, my girlfriend is in Greece. Do you guys, do you guys mind if I um, show you everything there is to see in Italy? We, it was supposed to be a three week trip in one week and then we go to Greece for the next two weeks, even though it was not the itinerary. That's what I mean by auto magic. See, see y'all, see y'all. She, she didn't know how she was gonna get to Greece, but she never gave up the vision of being in Greece. And I kept moving in the direction. Yes, and, and I, I imagine if you're standing at the Vatican at midnight or what you could call the first moment of the new day. And you pray to God, like, this isn't the way we're supposed to be doing it. I'm sure declaring God your have a lot intention of going on when he's in the middle of the Vatican at midnight, but not to listen. But he must be able, available to listen. And I can imagine a bus tour full of, of college girls going, We're going to Greece. We get to get out of old Italy and go to Greece. That, see, you guys. Get it, hear it. Do you see how as a speech writer, she has that experience of, of never, of persistence in the face of disappointment that dawns. So there's so many pieces to pull out of that, that at midnight, the darkest hour, both physically and emotionally, I still held on to my dream of being in Greece. I spoke my dream and it was heard, and I ended up on a bus going to Greece when I was supposed to be in Italy. 
I know. And then the funny thing I say in this in the talk, Eric, is I have the power to make my dreams come true. And the funny thing, which I had not planned on in the talk, but it just came out of me in the moment. Sometimes you say things that you hadn't planned on. Is I did not realize my power because I had diverted an entire bus with forty <laughs> people in it towards the land of my dreams. <laughs> See, but that is the power of pure passion: is you can just alter the universe for more than yourself. Yes. So you guys, you can see, we could sit here and chat all day. I am always inspired by you, Joyce. You teach, you laugh, you're, you share your experiences. You are a craftsman um, of, your, of your talent. I know that you work hard and rehearse hard and prepare to deliver the best that you can. And as somebody who has had the privilege of hearing you multiple times, your efforts shine bright. Um, I know there have been people that have laughed and have been, been impacted by you on so many levels. And I, I, I just, I got to tell you, thank you for being our Joyce. Thank you for being such a smile, such a joy, such a laughter for so many people. Eric, thank you so much for inviting me on your Facebook Live. You honored me when you did that. And I really, really enjoyed my time speaking with you. Oh, no, I was like, you know, I, I sort of have, so I'm just going to tell, because Joyce is in the room, I have this list of like my fantasy Facebook fun friend Friday people, and I was just like, am I big enough? Am I bold enough to go after one? And when you wrote back and said yes, it was like, <laughs> I kind of had to get up and run around the house for a few times, which made my dog really confused. Um, but okay. <laughs> if you live in this house, you're always confused. Again, I want to thank you, Joyce. If you will, um, do you have anything coming up? Are you doing speaker training or um, what are you working on right now? Uh, right now, well, if I tell you, I'll have to come and kill you all. But uh, I'm, right, I'm working on a couple of books. And this next quarter, I'm actually not taking up a whole lot of contracts. I do have one or two small contracts that I'm working with because I have to bring some uh, bread onto the table, but um, I'm working on a couple of books and I'm launching a course in uh, January. So that's what I'm working on. What is your course in January? Uh, so I have January? not yet. I'm launching. I'm, I'm going to be launching. So I'm working on creating all of the videos and everything at the moment. Yeah. So right. uh, the course in January. Sorry, you want to know what it is about? Uh, so basically, um, what I'm doing, so if you want to know what, uh, if any of you would like to know more about it, uh, you might want to consider joining my group. Maybe I'll post the link to the group because I'm running a series of challenges on how to make a difference, basically just by being you as one person, because a lot of us stop doing because we think we need a large tribe in order to achieve our dreams, but we don't. You need to start with you. If you are not able to do what you want, then why is the world going to collaborate with you to give you what you want, right? So you've got to model it first before the, the, the tribe rallies around you. So if you want to save the planet, you have to be saving the planet first with your tiny little actions that may not create a dent in the universe. So I'm starting this group. It's called One. For now, it's called One. I don't know what it will be called down the road because I'm still in the process of creating it. But there's going to be a series of challenges, like 30-day challenges of how to make an impact as one person, how to make an impact with your business, how to have courage. So there are 30-day challenges, how to have confidence, stuff like that. Like it's, it's going to be a series of challenges to empower you, not just for your own, for yourself, but also not for your own growth and evolution, but for the evolution and impact of the business that you're in. And it may not, you may not be, uh, you may not have a business. You may be in a career, you might be employed and you can still make a difference wherever you are. So I, I'll post I, a link to that group. I, yeah, I saw you post that and invite to the group. So do you guys, um, I love that idea of oneness, like the power of one. So I, and I know as you, as a, as a leader and a teacher are going to deliver that on a high level. Um, that's going to be exciting. That's so, as you said, so often we think one is too small to be of significance or to make the impact or alter the world. Um, and as you alluded to earlier in the beginning, Gandhi 
was just one when he got thrown off the train. And he was just one when he protested the salt. And he was just one when he began his journey towards the sea to mine his own salt. And yet, India now celebrates freedom because of one individual. Exactly. I mean, you know, Gandhi is one of my heroes, like really is, because first of all, he had a great sense of humor. If you read his book, uh, My Experiments with Truth, you will see his sense of humor. He was very well, well educated. The world sees him as this guy with just the dhoti and the star. But he was making a point that he was not going to wear Western clothes and be, um, uh, have his freedom taken away by the West, you know. So he spun what? his own cloth. Which, and as a, as a Westerner and American, we often see Gandhi as, who is it, Ben Kingsley? The, when, yes. you know, the ben later Kingsley. Gandhi. Um, when you really do dig into his life and you begin to see him as the full person, I mean, he was a prominent attorney. He was, you he know, was an attorney. He, he used to wear the waistcoat, you know. Life he... as, a, as a holy man. Uh, he had a very yeah. He used to call it, you know, you know, Eric. He used to wear he used to wear Western attire back when he was in Africa, practicing as an attorney, with you know the waistcoat and the coat and the shirt and the mm -hmm. trousers. And they used to call it the plus fours. And when he um, abandoned all that Western stuff and spun his own uh, khadi cloth from cotton and wore the dhoti, he used to call it he very jokingly. Told the Queen or wherever he was on a visit on a ship to England. He called it his minus force. <laughs> minus force. So yeah, I, but I think his story is fascinating. So take a moment and try and just do a little history on him. Um, because yes, we often think that we have to begin at the end to have significance. That you know, when we look at somebody like his life, we see the end, but we forget the beginning and the oneness that he represented by taking off the plus fours and and getting up off the train and not getting back on, and then empowering a nation one person at a time. So I love your idea of one. So that is going to be a course to follow. Um, do us a favor, and if not on this feed, on your own feed, so everybody can follow and friend you, see at least, oh, I want all of your speeches up there, but at least the persistence um, one, if it's there, and definitely the connection one, because I think I actually have that saved somewhere on my hard drive. I'll have to go look for it as well. It is, it is truly, you are a craftsman. And so if you get a chance to go over and watch Joyce and watch one of her speeches, understand that those three minutes probably took 300 hours to create, not only the experience, but to be able to deliver it. But you too have experiences in your life that seem ordinary, seem mundane, seem common, that what the lesson that you learned in it is the lesson that you're now inspired to teach others and can inspire others through. So don't overlook the lessons. Don't overlook the things that you experience that you don't think are big enough or grand enough or impactful enough to change a room because they are. That's why you were given those experiences. That's why you were given that part of your journey is to hold on to it and then to share it with a bigger audience. Yeah, I think that was the first lesson I learned uh, on my journey as a speaker, that nobody is ordinary. None of you, every one of you that's watching, you're super ordinary. And, and there's an audience that will relate only to you. They may not relate to me. They may not relate to Eric. They may not relate to the you know, famous speakers like Les and John, but they will relate to you. And that, that is the reason why you have to find the courage to tell your story. Your, what you consider ordinary stories, is what will reach the audience, your audience. Oh, so true, so true. Uh, you, have just, you have just filled my day. I don't know how I'm going to settle down for the rest of the afternoon and get the work done that I need to get done. But I want to thank you, my friend for being a fun friend Friday today, for joining me in this morning. And I know you took some extra time and glamorized just for us. And so I appreciate that as <laughs> I well. I had to put on my human face. I'd really frighten people if I came with my antenna. <laughs> hey, look what I show up wearing. You know, I, I think this is just to make everybody else feel good about their wardrobe selections. <laughs> so thank you, I, Eric, for having me on your show. I, I appreciate you being here. I will take this and download it and podcast it and YouTube it by the end of the day. We'll have it done with uh, subtitles as well. 
so that you can come back later in the day and steal some of those nuggets. Your notebook should be full. I promise you when I finish this today, I'm gonna burn up at least a notebook from all of the wisdom and teaching you gave so graciously and so abundantly to us. Take a moment, you guys, share this out, then jump over and get in Joyce's The One Group or One Group and, and just really experience the, the community that is being built here on Fun Friend Friday. Oh, All right, I think the we're both drinking. So I have to go. They want you home. All right. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thanks, so everyone. Much for a bye bye. Fantastic day. Bye bye, everybody. Have a great Friday. See you guys on Monday morning at 8 a.m. Eastern. Until then, be blessed.